Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to extend a very warm welcome to all our participants, dignitaries, and our esteemed guest speakers to the Commodity Fundamentals Forum, Billion and Base Metals, organized by the IMC Chamber of Commerce and Industry in association with MCX IPF. If you wish to know more about our knowledge and awareness initiatives, do not forget to visit the websites of IMC and MCX. All participants will be muted to avoid any disturbances during the course of the session. To consume less bandwidth and have clarity, you may like to stop video streaming at your end. In our endeavor to improvise our events, we request all participants to kindly post their feedbacks in the chat section. Also, please or put your relevant please in the chat section so that the same can be addressed during the Q&A session. So, as Vice President, IMC Chamber of Commerce Astri, to present the welcome address. Over to you, Mr. Korakiwala. So, uh, so unmute from your end, sir. Yeah, am I audible? Yes. Yes, yes sir. sir. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. It gives me immense pleasure to welcome each one of you to this interesting Commodity Market Fundamentals Forum covering bullion and base metals organized by Indian Merchants Chamber in partnership with MCX IPF. This is a part of a series of events IMC and MCX are conducting jointly from time to time to deepen and widen the Indian commodity derivatives market. This market has a huge potential for growth as commodities touch our everyday life in some way or the other. Energy products like crude oil, natural gas, coal, metals, industrial metals, precious metals, and agricultural commodities are all assigned a weight in the price index. Prices of these commodities have a bearing on the rate of inflation. As you know, gold and silver are popular investment assets as they are a good store of value and provide a good hedge during economic uncertainties. Around the world, huge investments are made in bullion because it provides attractive returns. Often investment in gold has outperformed other assets such as equities. Gold is also known as a portfolio diversifier safe haven asset and a hedge against inflation. SME and MSME sector undertakes manufacturing activities, including engineering goods and has exposure to commodities, especially base metals like copper, aluminum, and so on. SME, MSME units face price volatility in raw material and finished goods. So it will be prudent to practice price risk management. Therefore, whether producers or processors or industrial consumers or traders, those with exposure to commodities have to constantly monitor the market. This is especially important for those who take forward trading positions. Therefore, market out outlook or a view of the likely behavior of the market becomes very important. While several drivers impact the market, a study of the supply and demand fundamental is key to have a clear view about the unfolding future. On behalf of IMC, I must compliment MCX, India's leading commodity exchange and rated among the top in the world for partnering with IMC to discuss commodity market fundamentals. Also, I'm happy to share, IMC is a SEBI or recognized trading institution for commodity derivatives. Friends, we have lined up excellent speakers with domain expertise, their insights into the market dynamics, will surely benefit all of us. Please make the session interactive and extract the best possible out of these experts. Before closing, I'd like to share a few words about IMC for those who are not introduced to this August chamber. Established in 1907, 
and having its headquarters in the heart of Mumbai, the INC Chamber of Commerce and Industry is an apex chamber of commerce, trade and industry in the western region with a membership of over 5,000 members and over 150 trade associations affiliated to us. Together, it represents and advocates the interests of over 400,000 business and industry establishments across the country from diverse sectors of industry. It has 26 industry specific committees of experts to which it provides policy inputs and recommendations at various levels of government and organizes activities where eminent business and government leaders engage with its members on a wide range of issues to create an environment for sustainable economic development. IMC hosts various foreign delegations visiting India and provides a platform for interaction to expand business ties and address issues impacting the growth of business between the visiting country and India. We have an ADR center with arbitration and mediation facilities, education and training services, IMC library, IMC young leaders forum and a dynamic ladies wing and so on. Our state of the art venues available for hire to cater to various sizes of meetings are equipped with Wi-Fi and video conferencing facilities. Our meeting rooms have been made COVID protocol compliant. We are authorized by Government of India to provide issuance of certificate of origin for exporters and this service has now been made available online with digital stamping and signing features. The theme of this chamber this year is Reboot, Reform and Research. These three factors are going to be crucial for India and other economies around the world reeling under the impact of this pandemic. Once again, I welcome you all to this very interesting seminar and I'm sure there'll be a lot of learnings to take home. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Khurakiwala. May I now request the moderator of the session, Mr. G. Chandrasekhar, Director, IMC ERTF and Economic Advisor, IMC, to start with the proceedings of the panel discussions. Over to you, Mr. Uh, Chandrasekhar. Mr. Chandrasekhar. Sir, you're on the mute. Sir, you're, sir, on, you're mute. on mute, sir. Sir, you're sir, on you're mute. mute. Sir, sir you're mute. You will have to unmute yourself, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, which is what I've done now. Okay, all right. Uh, uh, it, 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 it's such a, such a delight for me to be back here in this uh, IMC MCX Commodity Market Fundamental Forum. Uh, we've been doing this uh, regularly uh, over the last three or four years, and it's it's always evoked tremendous response. Last month, I think we conducted uh, the same Commodity Fundamental Forum on energy market and, of course, agriculture, agriculture commodities. Today, we are going to focus on metals. And obviously, that will be in two parts. One uh, will be... Uh, one will be base metals and the second will be uh, precious metals. Therefore, and we have lined up, uh, as our vice president mentioned, some ex excellent speakers. I want to welcome uh, my young friend Kunal Shah from Nirmal Bang. I want to invite uh, Chirag Sheth from Metal Focus. I want to invite our own Rashmi uh, from MCX and, of course, Shivanshu, Shivanshu Mehta from, from MCX. They all don't need any introduction. They're all brands in their own, uh, in, in, uh, have their own stature. And, and therefore, I'm not going to uh, talk about them. But what they speak to us, uh, to the participants, uh, uh, is, is, is what is going to be important. Therefore, let me, let me set the ball rolling. Uh, let me set the ball rolling. Uh, we will start with base metals. Okay? And therefore, uh, after I make these uh, opening remarks and introductory remarks, I'll then invite uh, Kunal Shah to speak. Uh, and then, of course, we will get Rashmi from MCX to, 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 to pitch in also. And the second segment will, of course, be uh, gold and silver uh, uh, bullion. Okay? So on base metals, all of us know very, very clearly that China is the mover and shaker of the, of the world's industrial metals market, both uh, industrial metals and base metals. And all of us also know clearly there's a very strong positive correlation between economic growth and uh, metals consumption, particularly industrial metals or, 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 or base metals consumption. Most unfortunately, this year, 
COVID-19, the pandemic destroyed a significant part of the demand uh, from probably uh, from the second half of the first quarter. And, and we lost almost uh, the whole of uh, the second quarter. And in the second half, we are now beginning to get uh, a very strong sense of, uh, of recovery. And therefore, growth is certainly returning. And who is driving this growth? It is China, which is actually, uh, which is driving this growth. And base metals have been the largest beneficiaries of uh, the Chinese economic recovery, which has been underway over the last three months. And uh, this Chinese economic recovery is significantly fueled by uh, their stimulus package. And uh, in, in many cases in base metals, the prices are actually either very close to uh, or back at uh, pre-COVID levels. I think that's a kind of recovery that, that we have seen. Uh, but what, what are the reasons? Why, why has this happened? Very clearly, there are multiple factors that are working in the global base metals market, which has led to a certain rally in base metal prices over the, over the last two months. One, of course, I, I, I am convinced and I'm sure uh, our, our experts will, uh, will bear me out that this is, there is a huge, uh, huge liquidity boost by the uh, U.S. Federal Reserve. And therefore, uh, a, a part, of this, part of this rally uh, is because of, I call this liquidity-driven uh, commodity boom. And, uh, and the weaker uh, U.S. dollar has also certainly helped uh, uh, to an extent. Supply constraints because of lockdown in several countries, national lockdown, particularly in uh, countries that produce raw material, uh, they, this, that those supply constraints have also contributed to the price rise. Therefore, China primarily as a large consumer, the large importer, processor, and consumer is actually driving. Uh, but we must remember while China's appetite appears to be ravenous at this point of time, I find the rest of the world demand is, is, is somewhat uh, lackluster for, for base metals. And, and therefore, unless the rest of the world, economic growth in the rest of the world also uh, rises uh, along with, with China, uh, China alone uh, will be able to take the market to a certain, le certain level, but, but not beyond. China, China cannot cannot uh, drag the market along uh, too far. I think that, that that's something all of us have to remember. For my, my view is that at the moment, uh, we, are not going, we are not giving any price forecast. Uh, uh, let, us, let us make it very clear. We're only looking at the market, market dynamics, market fundamentals, and possible market direction over the next uh, two quarters. Uh, my view is most of the good news in the market is already priced in. And if, if most of the good news is actually already priced in, uh, then the upside potential for prices then becomes, it becomes quite limited unless, unless economic activity starts to surge outside of China in, 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 in rest of the world. But there are also risks that we must, we must uh, bear in mind. For example, will the Chinese stimulus uh, uh, package the booster dose that China has given. At what point of time or when will it start to fade? After all, all stimulus packages will start fading at some stage. And stimulus packages are not going to be endless. So when will it start fading? Will it fade in the second half of 2021? Or will it be uh, first half of 2022? We don't know. These are, these, are, these are actually question marks. The second uncertainty is uh, will there be a second wave of infection? Will that say if 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 there is a second wave of infection, second wave of infection, it will certainly uh, certainly impact adversely uh, the very nascent recovery uh, that 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 we are seeing. We don't know. We don't know when that vaccine is going to come, how effective, etc. Therefore, this is this is another risk. But at the same time, uh, the current high prices. And as we know, high prices usually encourage more supplies. And therefore, current high prices and relaxation of the containment measures by various countries, this combination is going to drive 
drive supplies uh, higher. It will increase mine output of the raw material output from the mines, and therefore uh, supplies are are most likely to start increasing. Therefore, I think this is a kind of uh, uh, a scenario that uh, that we need to be we need to be looking at. Uh, if uh, I have to dwell specifically on uh, on some of the uh, some of the base metals, I must say, uh, for example, if we were to take aluminium, uh, the supplies of aluminium have remained remained fairly robust, and there has been a, a, a absolute surge in Chinese output, which has neutralized the losses that the world has seen uh, in 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 other places, and 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 therefore further rise in Chinese output. Of aluminium in 2021 is very widely expected, but at the same time, emissions emissions are becoming increasingly critical, and uh, I believe Europe is going to impose a carbon tax uh, uh, in order to in order to curb uh, products uh, with uh, with high 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 emissions carbon emissions. For that, uh, therefore, uh, th this is a kind of a scenario that's coming out for aluminium. Uh, from a copper uh, perspective, I'm, I'm looking at uh, 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 there was a strike action in Chile, uh, in South America, as a result of which, of course, uh, mine output of uh, of copper ore uh, was was much lower uh, over the last uh, last several months. Therefore, that has led to reduced raw material availability for smelters in in, in China. Uh, the second one, there is a rumor. I don't know to what extent uh, uh, to believe this, but I would call it a rumor at this point of time. Uh, there is a buzz in the market that China will, will very soon announce an official plan to uh, to uh, to stockpile uh, to stockpile uh, uh, copper, and 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 therefore that that will also have an an, an impact uh, on on prices. Therefore, supplies are now likely to rebound. In terms of mine output and raw material availability, possibly uh, demand can surge further if uh, the Chinese government decide to decide to build a, a stockpile. Therefore, I think uh, the, this market's in a very exciting uh, exciting position. Uh, as far as nickel is concerned, all of us know the strong uh, correlation between stainless steel and nickel. Uh, in China, stainless steel production is very strong. It's been increasing over the last uh, three months, and therefore, I expect Chinese nickel consumption to continue to remain uh, to remain quite strong. But at the same time, nickel ore nickel ore stocks in China are also rising, and therefore, they will have they have they have uh, uh, they they have enough uh, supplies. For well, what what impact will it have? On the one hand, stainless steel production is rising. On the other hand. Uh, they have enough and more of uh, the raw material availability that that could that could have another impact and on on zinc um, uh, again <clears throat> uh, in china uh, zinc uh, the relationship between uh, galvanized steel and zinc uh, all of us all of us know very well for china zinc galvanized steel stocks are rising are, are rising uh, rising rapidly and and therefore uh, is is there further scope for increase in uh, uh, in uh, uh, galvanized steel production in china we still don't know they are spending huge amount of money on 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 fixed asset on infrastructure etc but uh, there is a possibility of a slight surplus of uh, of zinc supplies global uh, zinc supplies in 2021 2022 uh, uh, over the next uh, two years that can have potentially a, a certain impact on prices and last uh, of course the uh, lead uh, lead has always been uh, a, a kind of underperformer. Uh, the uh, the off late there has been a rebound in global uh, vehicle production uh, from the lows of the first half of the year. Uh, in the second half, uh, last quarter particularly, global vehicle production uh, is, is is rebounding, which is very positive uh, for which is very positive for uh, lead. But at the same time. There are also signals, at least in the month of October, that in China, in Europe, in the U.S., that vehicle production is beginning to slow down uh, from the from the level seen in uh, August, August and September. And lead actually has a very high reliance on secondary supplies.
and of course on car battery demand. Therefore, much will depend on how uh, how robust is a, is the vehicle uh, demand uh, all over the world over the next uh, say the whole of 2021. That that will impact uh, late prices. Therefore, this is a very broad uh, picture uh, of uh, of uh, the base metals market. So China is key. China is a mover and shaker of the market. And uh, I will, uh, with this, I will now invite uh, our, uh, I call Kunal Shah, the young Turk of the commodity market. I want to invite Kunal for his views on uh, the base metals market outlook uh, from a fundamental perspective. Kunal, the floor is yours. Okay, so first of all, uh, thanks uh, a lot, IMC. And uh, uh, I, I, I don't know, my video is not able to start. Yeah. So first we of all, can hear you. We can hear you. Thanks a lot, uh, IMC. As always, it is my pleasure and honor to be a part of this panel, esteem panel. And uh, Chandrasekhar ji doesn't need any introduction. He himself, uh, we call him guru of commodity market, and we mean it. He has been there uh, for so many years, guiding everyone. Uh, now, coming to the main topic about base metals, uh, uh, I, I, I present to you the macro outlook of. Uh, uh, China and the global economy and what is the road ahead for the metals. So uh, let us, I'll begin with my presentation. So can everyone see this presentation? Yes, sir. Yeah, I can see. Yes, yeah. Mr. Shah. Yeah. So, uh, so far it has been a, a clear high, highway ride for all the markets, uh, maybe commodities, equities, all assets, everything has rallied together. But I think the times are going to change from now onwards and we are going to see a more volatile ride rather than a one side uh, up move or the one side down move. So I think uh, a lot of things like Mr. Chandrasekhar just said in his introduction speech that a lot of positive news have been already factored in by the markets. So now from now onwards, we are entering towards a very volatile ride rather than just uh, upside. So now you will have an opportunity even, you know, even if you short certain commodity or if you go long, you will have an opportunity on either side rather than just. So what we saw in metals in last six months was just a one way ride. So from the month of March, we've seen a massive rally. So no one would have imagined in the month of March that in, in a matter of six months, this kind of rally will take place and why we will just focus on that. So first of all, before we go into uh, uh, what is going to be the outlook, where, where are we right now? Okay. Uh, where where the global economy is heading after the kind of crisis we saw. So if you look here, the first arrow, pre-COVID level, after that we saw continuous contraction. And here we've drawn two lines, red one and the blue one. So this blue one is basically the economies which have printed and which are doing well right now, and red one which are yet to do well. So this is, the blue ones are U US, China, South Korea, Vietnam, Taiwan, these economies are already showing signs of recovery. So, and a lot of markets such as India, Australia, these countries are yet to recover from the shock and gradually they are going to recover. So this is a, not a traditional term, but they call it a K-shape recovery where developed markets who have printed a lot of, uh, who have infused a lot of uh, dollars in their economy have already started to do well, but emerging market, developing markets are still taking time. And now they are going to slowly follow the leads of what happened in the developed market. So this time the recovery is going to be the K-shape recovery. Uh, what is basically IMF has predicted, and this is directly impacting uh, what is going to happen with metals. So IMF has forecasted in 2020, uh, the GDP growth will be minus 4.9%. So if you see from such a long time, we have not seen such a big shock uh, in terms of the global GDP uh, downward growth revision. Minus 4.9 is something what we saw. And now we are gradually recovering. And next year, they are expecting this to move up to 5.4%. But forget about that. The main part is the, the shock, the shock what we saw and the recovery from there. And this all recovery has led mainly by China. China is still, I would, if you ask me, which is the economy, which is really done well in last six to eight months in terms of the number, economic number, which is produced by the government, I think it is definitely China. 
So when we talk about base metals, it, we talk about China. More than 50% of the consumption of base metal takes place in China. So what happens in China directly affects uh, uh, the outlook of uh, base metals. So this chart, if you look, uh, the manufacturing PMIs across the globe. If you see what has happened from the month of January, February, March, after sharp plunge, the manufacturing PMI across the world have recovered so sharply. So the way the crisis took place. So I would like to quantify and explain the kind of crisis what we saw uh, uh, early part of this year. So in 2008, when there was a Lehman Brothers crisis and after that global central bankers decided to print money. So at that time, two to two and a half trillion dollars of liquidity was infused. So from last three years of my uh, speech, uh, my speech at IM, uh, IMC, I have always said the world is completely changed post 2008 crisis. So the traditional economics driving prices of commodities, driving prices of other asset class have changed completely because central bankers have infused this massive quantitative easing program. But this time it, the world is going to be changed further and I think we are not, it doesn't seem that we are going to return to normalcy anytime during next two, three years. <clears throat> so in 2017, 18, we saw federal reserve were selling their own bonds and they were reversing that process of, uh, what they, the, the massive bond, which was there on their balance sheet, they, they started to so, sell those bonds in the market. But after this crisis, I, I think that time is, is going to be something we are not going to see that time coming normally back to the market. So, uh, uh, I think the world has changed. The traditional economic principles are at stake right now. It, it is not working. So on one hand, we saw this kind of fall in the manufacturing PMI and you see this kind of spurt. Why, why this kind of sudden spurt in the manufacturing PMI across the world we saw. So, if you look at the fiscal responses of the central bankers, now this is the chart where uh, you can understand the kind of money which is pumped by the central bankers. So after the COVID-19 crisis, we saw US so far has printed $2.8 trillion, Japan $2.2 trillion, Europe $600 billion. So cumulatively, vis-a-vis -vis two, 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 two and a half trillion dollars of printing in 2008, this time, this number is 13 and half trillion dollar and not ending in year 2019 through 2020, 20 so far, we have seen massive rate cuts across the world. So, uh, I had given a task to my team to find out how much, uh, rate cuts have taken place in last one and a half year. And you won't believe that number is more than 1300, 1400 bips of rate cut across all countries in the world. So imagine the kind of monetary debasement which is going on in the world. It is absolutely something, you know, uh, it is not normal. So our lives are running normal. Everything is normal. It seems everything is normal, but the way this money have come into the system, financial system, there is inflation of the value of asset. The, in, the assets are basically getting inflated because there is so much liquidity floating around the world. So if uh, I was tracking the price of copper and determining the outlook, I also have to add that new thing, which is called the QE money supply is something, you know, which is basically helping the prices of commodities to go up. So it is no longer the traditional demand and supply, which is basically driving the outlook of commodities or the other assets. It is the quantum of money. So now federal reserve is talking about another stimulus, maybe after election or maybe before election. And the size of that is what? another 1.8 to $2 trillion. The size of Indian economy is two and a half trillion dollars. And these guys are printing 13, 14, $15 trillion in a matter of six months. So what is going to happen and what are the repercussion of this, all of these, which is happening right now. So I always say the central bankers are the gods of the financial market. They know what to do best. So whatever they have done right now, it helped the market, but what next? What is next? So we'll discuss about that. What is basically next? So first of all, uh, let us see, um, when we talk about metals, it is always about China and what happened in China. 
So in China, in November, early November 2019, the COVID uh, cases were seen. December was, uh, they made it vocal and January, February, March, there was the strictest lockdown in the history of any economy. We have not seen such lockdown the way, the what we saw in Wuhan. And what it, what it did is Chinese GDP, which was 6% in the Q4, in the first quarter of 20, it dipped to minus 6.8%. Imagine $13 trillion economy on a quarter on quarter basis, the contraction is as sharp as 7%. If you see what happened to retail sales, minus 19% from 7%. Fixed asset investment, which is one of the major driver of commodities, from 5% to minus 16%. If you look at the residential investment, minus 7% from 11%. So you see this number, these are not normal numbers and exports down by 11%. But from the month of March, what we saw was a gradual recovery. So April was the month when things have stabilized in China. And if you see what happened in quarter two, from minus 6.8% to 3.2%, and now the forecast for the third quarter will be 4.9%. The retail sales from minus 19 to minus four, now it is almost expected to be 1%. Fixed asset investment from minus 16 to 3.6. And this quarter, quarter th third quarter, it is expected to be averaging about 7.1%. Residential investment from minus 7.2 to again back to 11.7%. If you look at the industrial production, this is very important. Industrial production in two quarters have normalized. So in fourth quarter of 2019, the industrial production was 5.9%. It has come back to 5.8% this quarter. So imagine the way the recovery have taken place in China. So China has again led from the front and driven the entire metal market, the consumption, the housing market, the infrastructure market, have done well but what are the gray areas still if you look at the exports it is picking up but still yet to show a lot of strength and export is still uh, robust in last quarter imports also uh, which was 5.6 percent before the crisis struck now are expected to be at 4.3 percent so things are getting normal at china so chinese economy is showing signs of uh, stability okay so if you see what happened in their inflation, so inflation also have dipped from 5% to 2.7 and, and this last quarter is 2.3%. So this leaves China with a massive amount of foreign exchange reserve what they are having. This still leaves them with ample of firepower to still stimulate their economy if things are not going well going forward. Most important for commodities, producer price index, inflation at manufacturer's level. Quarter two, it was minus 3%. Now it is minus 2%. And in fourth quarter, I am expecting it to be minus zero or, or 1%. So the inflation is also rising now uh, at the manufacturer's level. Money supply, interesting, 8.7%. M2, I generally consider M2. 8.7% to 10%. 11%. So money supply has risen to 11% in China from 8%. So understand things are stable in china and what does it mean copper prices are up from 325 to 540 nickel prices are up from 800 rupees to 1150 so it is all subject to china so if you ask me kunal what is your outlook on china going forward uh, from the domestic point of view so whatever after the covid crisis uh, from the trade point of view china still will get the tremors from the Western world and other parts of the world. So people are not happy uh, with whatever, whatever has happened. So the anti-China rhetoric is picking up across the world. So the domestic demand, the domestic consumption is something, you know, what is basically drive the Chinese economy and Chinese government is well aware of that. So even though the exports have done well recently because of the pent up demand, Going forward in year 2021, we expect the exports of China to take a hit and anti-Chinese rhetoric will pick up and will continue. So whatever growth China is going to generate 
So even if Chinese economy grows on an annual basis at three percent, four percent, it's massive number. So thirteen trillion dollar economy producing, say for example, four percent growth. So every year they are adding five hundred and twenty billion dollar. And U.S. economy, twenty-one trillion dollar economy, growing at two percent, will generate four hundred billion dollars. So that five hundred dollars of revenue with China is going to generate, out of its uh, domestic economy, its uh, largest uh, population it is having, that itself is enough. And the modes of this revenue are generating. So they are relying more and more on the consumption-driven uh, economy rather than the export-driven economy. so see what has happened recently so after the crisis the credit the china's credit growth is started to grow so total credit to non financial and bank loans these two factors have started to grow uh, remember china stimulus 600 billion dollar okay now this is very interesting if you see what has happened in china manufacturing led the rebound after contracting to minus 15% the manufacturing in china is again up and almost near pre covid levels but in manufacturing which are the sectors which are doing well mining still not doing well so this this itself is a reason if you look at this line the mining growth in manufacturing is still minuscule utilities minuscule but the actual manufacturing activity is doing very well if you look at what is happening which are the areas which is doing well in china the right hand side if you look at this chart that is infrastructure no it is manufacturing and housing So, if you look this line, uh, green line, the housing sector is doing extremely well. May it be new home sales, existing home sales, they are picking up because the interest rates are going down, and uh, that the construction activity continue to remain robust in China. Manufacturing activity also is doing well. So, manufacturing and housing, these are the two pillars right now which is driving China's economy. So, when i explained you fixed asset investment is very important and if you look at this chart china's fixed asset investment by government led that is state owned and private the interesting part is the private fixed asset investment is growing up so it is not just the government is spending money it is the private owned fixed asset investment which is accelerating so this is very positive sign for china and obviously for madrid right hand side i explained you uh, the importance of uh, property market in china and property market is really booming from the month of may if you look here the housing sales the property investment in china and housing starts all of these are showing a sharp uptick not still reach pre covid levels but they are showing sharp up, uh, uptick so what does it mean it it means the outlook of chinese economy irrespective of what is happening in the world remains positive so i think whatever you are seeing in metals market is purely justified because of the excess liquidity floating across the world and china doing well so if the outlook of chinese economy starts worsening then only we are going to see a bear market but i don't see any bear market for commodity and for metals i'll explain you why what has happened in this kunal Yeah. Kunal, my request is, I think you should conclude in two minutes. We'll also yeah. have another round of questions after yeah. other presentations are complete. If you don't yes, mind, yes, yes, yeah. yes. I'll complete it in two minutes. Yeah. So yeah. Most interesting part here is, uh, I'll explain on the outlook of uh, all this. So, in South America itself, more than four hundred and thirty mines have have been shut off, or uh, not just particular commodity, overall commodity because of the COVID crisis. So, the supply side of a lot of these commodities, metals. will continue to remain weak for extended period of time no miners can start operation the way it used to be before so the supply side is going to remain weak now i'll explain you in 2 minutes the fundamentals of most of the commodity so copper if you look here after all this copper market continues to rem remain in a deficit of 3 and 1/2 lakh tons if you look at china's copper imports refined copper imports they continue to remain there at higher elevated level if you look at the mine production this year is expected to show minimum amount of growth and the copper treatment charges are on a continuous downward it means that the market remains tight nickel interesting demand side story if you look at the chart of global vehicle sales 
they are continuously moving up electronic vehicle says this is something which is going to drive the demand of nickel the total use of nickel right now is 4% of the total use 70% of nickel is used in stainless steel and 4% is used in batteries in batteries 55% of the electronic car batteries are produced in china but this number in next 5 years will be 10% so the nickel usage in the battery is going to go up significantly and this revolution of electric car is not going to just remain to us china europe and other country but it is going to spread across the world so next 5 years the demand side of the nickel looks very 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 bright and the inventory at shanghai and lme both continues to remain low so kunal uh, pardon pardon my interruption pardon my interruption i think we will uh, uh, we we need to at least this part of the presentation let us conclude and there'll be another round uh, of of questions which okay. uh, which we can take huh? if you don't mind sorry about this okay uh, i'm uh, thanks uh, kunal of course uh, i'm i'm not surprised about what uh, the presentation that kunal has made because he does this uh, research quite thoroughly uh, i'm now going to invite uh, rashmi from mcx to talk about uh, mcx's base metals contract and, uh, and 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 explain to our participants what it is all about please how much time would you need uh, rashmi about 10 to 12 minutes rashmi madam just uh, unmute unmute from your side sorry yeah so i will yeah. try not to take more than you know 10 to 12 minutes so what yeah. i'll do is i'll try and skip slides wherever i think they're not important to talk about oh, yeah. okay good right. that, that's fine yeah right okay but, so but do three... but please sorry. do enough justice don't rush through it do enough no, no, justice no, yeah. no not at all not at all <laughs> uh good evening everybody uh, i'm i'm rashmi from mcx and uh, you know while kunal has given you a wonderful understanding on you know what's really happening in terms of fundamentals i'll just give you a quick glance in terms of you know what are these five metals and you know what kind of sectoral participation uh, they have so largely you'll find ali copper that you know find their uh, you know usage in in you know transportation building construction etc nickel zinc are very very largely used in the in the steel uh, industry so engineering steel in fact zinc is used a lot in galvanizing because of its strong anti rust uh, you know uh, qualities and lead of course finds itself very very extensively in the battery industry so which is why they are they are very uh, you know very well known as industrial metals because if you look you know the participation across the board uh, you know it's it's around industries of practically every kind uh next uh you know what are the factors again uh you know i'm not going to delve too much in it every commodity is totally dependent on you know how the demand supply situation is uh and you know the current covid situation has given us enough fodder to understand that you know how uh you know uh, uh these uh, these factors really influence our market so whether you have supply disruptions that happen in chile uh you know in the copper mines whether you had you know uh you know a lot of uh, issues in terms of uh, disasters that have been you know striking on a regular basis in various mines across the world you know which is where the supply constraints come in and you know the reduction in demand during the entire lockdown periods across the world so ultimately commodities are nothing but that get affected by the demand supply uh, situation so that's the primary area and then of course you have specifically where you have large countries like us china in terms of what policies that they follow what are the government policies that are going to come from these countries which essentially then set the note in terms of what would be the factors that would influence the market so you know uh, i am not again going to delve into that because i think kunal has given an, an, an in depth understanding of that but by and large these being industrial commodities Uh, a lot of you know uh, growth uh, is dependent you know uh, countries that you know are are showing very robust growth uh, you know uh, would have a very strong uh, demand for uh, the base metals now what gets traded on mcx aluminum copper lead nickel zinc all five of them get traded on mcx in you know the trading quantities that i have mentioned so ali lead and zinc is essentially our five metric ton contracts uh nickel is 1.5 and copper is 2.5 we used to have you know mini contracts earlier which we stopped uh, last year you know based on regulatory directive uh how are these contracts uh, structured or you know what are the contract specifications like now i would would like to for some of you who knew the earlier contracts of mcx i would like to 
you know, specify that all these contracts on MCH today are deliverable contracts. So all of them, aluminum, copper, zinc, nickel, uh, uh, and lead are deliverable contracts on the exchange. And, uh, you know, the price quote that you see today on the exchange is an X warehouse price, which is excluding GST. Uh, so, so aluminum, zinc, and lead, which are five metric ton contracts, have, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, their price quote uh, bases the X warehouse. Uh, all our warehouses are in Maharashtra, in, in Thane district. And for lead, we have it in Chennai. Uh, each of these contracts has a certain tolerance. Uh, you know, if you, re if you look at the delivery unit, so the trading unit and the delivery unit match. Uh, that essentially is because, again, a directive from our regulators where uh, they're very emphatic that whatever gets traded, whatever trading unit you're going to keep, your delivery unit has to match. Now, what happens is that each, uh, each of these metals, when they get manufactured, they may or may not conform to the exact tonnage uh, that we are looking at. So, for example, if aluminum is manufactured in a, as a one metric ton um, ingot, it could be a little over, uh, it could be 1.1 metric ton, it could be 987 kgs. Hence, each of these metals, we have added a tolerance limit basis which we accept. So for example, for aluminum, for copper, for zinc, and for nickel, the tolerance limit is at is, is 10%. So if one were to deliver, say, copper on the MC, on, on the at the M6 warehouse, which is say 2,500 kg, we will accept copper up to uh, you know, uh, 2.25 and 2.75 metric ton. If your copper is over and above that, it will get rejected. And this stands true for all of these uh, uh, metals that we have mentioned here with their tolerance units. For, uh, for lead, our tolerance is at 15% because, you know, the lead variations are higher vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the other metals. Like I said, the delivery centers for all our contracts today are uh, in Thani in uh, Maharashtra. And for lead, we have it in Chennai. So the primary delivery center for lead is in Chennai and Maharashtra works out to be its additional delivery center. The initial margins are 8 to 10% across. So you have aluminum and copper at 8% and you have zinc, nickel and lead at 15, uh, 10%. Uh, for each of these uh, metals, there is a client and a member level position. These positions are essentially to see that there is no cornering of the market. So uh, so every member will have a certain um, a certain limit to which he can trade. And in turn, there will be a limit to which the client can trade. If there are any violations in these position limits, then there are penalties that are involved from the exchange level. So this is how the contracts that are working on MCH today uh, function. And all of these contracts are available on monthly basis. And at any given point in time, there will be five contracts available for metal for any of the participants to trade in. Uh, what what is a traded price on MCX today? You know, earlier we were an LME cash settled price or an LME cash settled uh, contract, but today because we are deliverable, our contract is inclusive of all of these parameters that you can see on left hand side. So there will be an, uh, an international number. You will add a premium to it, then you'll multiply it by the US PINR. Uh, you'll add the customs duty value. You get the landed cost, and then you will add the clearing and the transportation charges. Uh, these numbers are all excluding GST. The GST comes into play only once the actual delivery takes place. So the 18% GST will only come into play once you have the 18% uh, uh, will only come into play the 18% GST once an actual delivery will happen. Also, the, the numbers that you're seeing today or the sequence that you're seeing today, these are the particulars that get included in the contract uh, today. So this is more a representation number please keep in mind that each and every number here, barring the customs duty, is a dynamic number. Okay, so, you know, your, your LME numbers are changing all the time, your premium changes all the time, your customs duties, landed, uh, your, your clearing, transportation, all of these are dynamic numbers, and hence the numbers accordingly will keep changing on the uh, M6 platform also. Um, how have our contracts done, you know, pre and post, uh, you know, the conversion of our contracts from cash settle to the uh, delivery base. So if you see the ADTV uh, that we have for uh, aluminum, copper, lead, nickel, and zinc in 1920, uh, in, as well as the, the open interest, those numbers are, are higher, uh, you know, and what we have done in, in, in 2021 till September, those numbers, of course, uh, you know, have kind of uh, moved uh, down to some extent. 
but we eventually picked up really well in copper and nickel and you know to some extent in zinc aluminum and lead still continue to be a bit of laggards uh, but we are very hopeful that you know by the end of this financial year we should be able to pick up in these metals also uh, when you see this number 111604 it is basically the amount of deliveries that have happened on mcx via our platform so we have had over 1 lakh tons of of uh, metals that has been delivered on the exchange in the last uh, almost about a year and a half now this is how the performance has been which you know i just uh, showed you earlier so from the april 20th you know post the lockdown period and you know once the trading hours on the LM, on, on mc x picked up uh, the performance of the contracts you know gradually moved up of course there have been dips but by and large the performance of the contracts have been really really strong now what is the value proposition of these mc x contracts today the first one that i would want to speak to you about actually taking delivery or giving delivery on the exchange um what really happens when you you know when when you as a participant you're from the industry and you would want to actually give and take delivery so what is the process for it essentially the delivery happens on the last four days of the month so let's look at it uh, you know if you look at the the calendar that i have created for october november december so just look at it from 26th onwards for october so the last uh, working or the last uh, you know expiry of the contract for october is 30th so your delivery period for this contract will start from 26th onwards so essentially your delivery is from e to e minus 4 e being expiry and e minus 4 being the uh, you know the date from which the delivery for the contracts will actually begin so each of uh, you know the months uh, for this particular uh, calendar year i have created which is october november december so if you if you look at these uh, if you look at the calendar the ones highlighted in yellow are the uh, are the days for uh, the tender period and the delivery period you will get to see this entire settlement calendar on 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 our website if any of you would like to understand that how this entire settlement calendar is created besides all of our deliveries will happen through a module that we call as comris which is commodity receipt information system it is nothing but a dmat module so when you want to give delivery or when you want to take delivery you have to come via the comris module comris is is a module which the client has a direct access to so if you're working through a member the member will give you a direct access to you know uh, to actually get into uh, the comris module and and you know work through your entire delivery process in the last four days of the month so let me just give you a quick example that assuming you were to you know do a delivery in the month of october how how the process would happen so because your delivery period is from 26 to 30th uh, you know 30th being the last working day of the month uh, let's say you decide uh, you know you have created a buy position on mcx on the 26th you come to the exchange and you decide that you want to buy 50 tons of copper like you there will be similar number of people who would be interested in in buying you know a uh, certain quantity of copper and there will be similar number of people who would probably be interested in selling uh, copper so a like i told you you will first give your intention via comris module your intention to the exchange should be given by 5 pm at 5:30 the exchange on 26th october will display uh, you know that how much buy and sell intention has been received and then on the 27th the next day so on 26th night we have you know our own algorithm we have our own software that will do a marking for all of these deliveries so all the buyers will be matched to the sellers uh you know uh, the ones who have given an intention to the exchange will be given priority and anything that's left open will then be marked delivery so next day on 27th in the morning the buyers come to know you know the quantity that they have been marked for delivery by 2 pm they have to pay the full amount of uh you know the 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 commodity value to the exchange uh the seller will uh, of course pay the entire uh, you know will also give the entire material to the exchange now with the seller what really happens is that when they come on the 26th to the exchange to give their sell intention we will not consider their intention to be valid unless and until they have already deposited the metal in our warehouse at least two days ago and under comris they have created an e receipt so on the 27th uh, the buyer will come and give us funds and on the 27th the seller will give us that e receipt so assuming if the seller on the 26th has not gotten his goods in our warehouse and has made it into a dmat form and taken that receipt uh, you know his intention will not be considered valid so 
uh, on the 26th buyers and sellers both are allowed to give intention but sellers necessarily have to have that e receipt you know to be able to submit it to the exchange the next day which is on the 27th so 27th the uh, you know uh, there will be at 4 o'clock we will give uh, the buyer that particular receipt and we will give the seller his funds so this is what we call as a t plus 1 process and this would repeat itself uh, you know, day after day till the expiry date. So, so whatever happens on 26th, uh, you know, intentions done on 26th will get settled on 27th. Intentions given on 27th will get settled on 28th. And similarly, all of these intentions will finally culminate on the last day, like on the 30th, whatever, whoever is giving the uh, intentions will get settled on the 2nd of November because in between there is a Friday, uh, there's a Saturday and a Sunday. So this is how the process happens on the exchange as far as the delivery and settlement is concerned, uh, you know, and everybody has to adhere to these timelines in terms of pain and payout. Once the goods, once, uh, you know, the buyer uh, gets that e-receipt uh, from the seller, he can actually go to the warehouse and, uh, you know, take that e-receipt and collect the, uh, you know, decide to remove the metal from the warehouse and take it if he wants to take it wherever or he can continue keeping it in the warehouse you know for as long as he wants the warehouse service providers will charge him a rent which i'll quickly just tell you about it uh on mcx today we only accept lme approved brands so whether you have copper whether you have aluminium you have lead you have nickel you have zinc all of these that get accepted by the warehouse service provider have to conform to the london metal exchange uh, approved grades and brands. If you have anything which is not an LME approved grade and brand, it gets rejected at the warehouse. So when you bring this metal to the exchange warehouse or to the exchange approved warehouse, it has to be accompanied by a certain amount of documentation. So you need to have an invoice, you need to have a certificate of analysis, you need to have you know, a certificate of origin, you need to have the right kind of packaging with weight and bundle numbers and units given. Uh, all of this metal is weighed at the uh, warehouse. You know the tolerance is you know taken into uh, into into consideration, and then eventually uh, you know this metal is then accepted uh, in, in in the exchange warehouse. Currently, anybody who has deposited metal in the exchange warehouse, the validity for that is for five years. Uh, you know, so suppose if you've deposited on 26th October 2020, you can keep the metal in the warehouse for up to 2025. Uh, also, uh, the metal has to be not older than five-year production. So, like I said, if you're depositing on 26th October 2020, your metal should not be older than 26th October 2015. So, there is a five-year, uh, you know, production that comes into play, uh, 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 you know, uh, before you deposit, uh, you know, that metal. Like I said earlier, all our warehouses are in 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 Chennai, in as uh, sorry, in Maharashtra, in in, uh, in Thani, spread across Bhivandi, Panvel, and Uran. Uh, these are the charges. So the average charge works out to be about 35 rupees per metric ton per day. The earlier you put the metal in the warehouse, the better it is because then you're paying a little lesser. Also, if you're unloading and loading and if you're using certain equipment at the warehouse, then there are handling charges. All these charges have to be paid directly by the client to the warehouse service provider the exchange doesn't come into the middle, uh, you know, and, you know, the warehouse service provider typically has a single day billing cycle with, you know, additional GST to it. This is how we have done as far as the uh, metals is concerned in terms of deliveries. So when we first did the delivery in March 2019 for aluminium, we just had 10 metric tons that came into our warehouses. And, you know, it kind of peaked somewhere in October and February to almost 10,000. But by and large, we've been anywhere between the range of five to 8,000 that we've on an average been getting uh, in the exchange, and like I told you, till now we have done one like eleven metric, uh, one like eleven thousand metric tons of deliveries over the last year and a half. Uh, and a very heartening time for us was actually the lockdown period because the exchange actually worked out to be what you call as delivery of last resort. Uh, a lot of metal that was lying on port, a lot of metal that was lying, you know, uh, you know, unused by a whole host of. Uh, traders, uh, consumers, they use the exchange warehouse to deposit their metal. Uh, luckily for us, a couple of our warehouses were actually functioning during the uh, during the delivery period, uh, during the lockdown period. So if you see from March, April, May, June, which are the peak lockdown periods of, uh, you know, this, this particular COVID era, 
a lot of metal got deposited on the MCX. And then eventually this same metal actually saw its way out somewhere post June, a lot of this metal also started flowing out as the offtake of metal started increasing in the uh, physical market. So I think if I would clearly say a value proposition, I think all buyers and sellers of metal today understand the importance of an exchange delivery mechanism where you can actually use this exchange to you know, deposit. When you feel that the prices are right, you can, you can sell the metal here. When you feel that prices are you know, on the lower side, you can actually pick up metal from here. Uh, this is what the current stock situation is on, on MCX, not dwelling too much on this. I'll be circulating this, this presentation so you can actually have a look at the numbers. Uh, you know, uh, the next value proposition, which I want to you know, bring to your notice is, you know, uh, what really happens when volatility hits your business. So these are the volatility numbers from 2015 to 2020. If you actually see, it's roughly about 18 to 20% across all metals. And like you would all know that volatility is, is something which is not in our hands. It is largely uh, due to factors which are way beyond the control. It could be trade policies, it could be uh, geopolitical events. If you just see what is happening right now in the COVID era, you know, how it's been affecting businesses. But ultimately, what it really hampers or what it really hits is the uh, company's bottom line. And ultimately, it's a deviation in your budget. So there are just two choices in that, whether you can actually just wait for the right price to come in. You lose something today, you gain something tomorrow. Or you can use the exchange platform to actually lock in your raw, raw material prices. So you come to the exchange, you hedge, you take an equal and opposite position on, on the exchange and you know based on whatever is your physical market position and you lock your raw material prices so if you're a buyer of copper cathode or aluminium ingot or if you're buying nickel in cathodes these are all raw materials that you will eventually use to to create a certain fabricated product so if you want to buy if you want to lock in that raw material prices the exchange works out to be an excellent platform to actually hedge your raw material prices so i had an example for this but you know i think that's going to take time so so Chandrasekhar sir, I'm going to skip this. You know, they could probably learn this once, uh, you know, we circulate this, this particular uh, presentation. Uh, finally, I want to come down to something which is very, very important and I think is more in line with, you know, what is what is really the need of the R. One is the launch of the metal decks, which is the uh, base metals index, which we recently launched about, uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago. This is a composite single index made up of five metals, aluminum, copper, lead, nickel, and zinc. Uh, they have, you know, the, the constituent weightages are, you know, given uh, right in front of you. Zinc has, of course, a higher weightage and copper. So both of these are, are having a higher weightage. The, the index has been constructed basis three-fourths of what is the liquidity of these metals on, on the exchange and one-fourth, of course, based on their production and imports. And I think it's going to be an excellent tool for investors, for, for hedge funds, for uh, professional traders, financial institutions. You know, a lot of our retail participants, uh, you know, uh, moved out saying that they wanted, uh, you know, not, uh, they wanted to continue in cash settle contracts. So this is basically a cash settle index. And I think, uh, you know, looking at the way uh, markets have been moving, uh, you know, it's also going to be an excellent uh, idea in terms of giving you uh, what, uh, you know, the industrial, uh, um, uh, sector representation of industrial metals is. And finally, uh, a very important initiative by the exchange, what we call as Made in India and Priced in India, is the impanelment of the Indian lead producers for MCX. So uh, till now, like I told you, we had only been impaneling or we were only accepting LME approved brands. But looking at the fact that the domestic producers should also get an equal chance to be able to deliver their metal on the exchange, we found out that lead was one such metal which, which could lend itself the best because the lead market, refined market, secondary lead market is almost 10x of the primary uh, lead market. So we created an entire document called the principal document for lead producers uh, on which we have created an eligibility criteria for them. This particular document is available on our website. Uh, they can actually, if they meet this eligibility criteria, uh, you know, we will get uh, their plant and their entire, uh, you know, systems audited by a technical auditor. We will do chemical analysis of, you know, what, uh, you know, the, the, the MCX created uh, chemical uh, specification for lead, which is 99.98% lead purity. And then we will empanel these local Indian brands on MCX to make them uh, eligible for delivery. 
So this is the first time that the exchange is trying to create what you call as the NCX approved list, and pretty much in line with you know the Prime Minister's vision of Atman Nirbhar Bharat. And this is like I said, just the beginning. We want to, or we will eventually going forward add more brands, more grades of other metals, and we look forward to a lot of you participating and supporting uh, you know the exchange in in this particular endeavor. So with this, I'm going to uh, end my uh, presentation. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, like I said, we're moving towards indigenization, right, right. and and you know that's what you know this entire presentation was about: establishing an India Prize benchmark. Thank you All so right. much. Thank, and uh, thank you, thank you, Rashmi, for taking us through this wonderful presentation. Uh, while uh, Kunal gave us a helicopter view of the global. Uh, base metals market focusing more and more on China. Obviously, China is is, is a significant uh, player. Uh, Rashmi has given us uh, what is uh, MC is doing about uh, base metals trading and base metals contract and uh, risk management as far as base metals value chain participants are concerned. Thank you very much. I think it's been it's very very interesting. I only wish we had more time for for these kinds of uh, discussions and. And 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 uh, I'm sure there'll be there'll be other another uh, opportunity uh, yes. after after base metals. We are now moving on to uh, uh, a more exciting, more glittering uh, 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 metal. I mean, obviously, bullion, uh, precious metals. Uh, Shivan, Shu, are you there? And Chirag? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, so very very clearly, gold and silver. Uh, economic uncertainty is driving gold and silver up. Liquidity boom uh, is driving these uh, precious metals up, uh, and uh, significantly, financial investors are 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 uh, they are demonstrating ravenous appetite uh, for investment, uh, particularly in gold, despite a very poor physical demand. Okay, so it's it's not the physical market which is driving uh, uh, driving uh, gold and silver. But primarily investment demand, which is driving. But uh, so what 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 are those what are those major uh, drivers? One, of course, is debt levels are rising. Uh, we have quantitative easing, as uh, Kunal uh, mentioned in his uh, presentation. Some what thirteen trillion dollars uh, are are, uh, are are floating around in the U.S. Money is really dirt cheap. In fact, uh, I, I would call that a huge amount of economic uncertainty. Ultra low interest rates, extremely uh, accommodative uh, monetary policy of uh, major uh, central bankers around the world. All these have, all this has combined uh, to to propel gold prices higher uh, and higher. In the first half of uh, 2020, of course, gold had a fantastic, uh, fantastic rally. But uh, see what's happened in the last uh, last in recent weeks. For example, it's still. Struggling, it did reach two thousand dollars a troy ounce uh, some time ago, but in the last uh, few weeks, it's still struggling uh, to to uh, to even stay in the vicinity of uh, uh, nineteen hundred uh, nineteen hundred dollars or so. Uh, and, and therefore, uh, what what is likely to happen going forward? So long as the risk of uh, uh, environment continues. So long as risk of environment continues and money, cheap money, continues to be uh, in 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 the market, I'm sure uh, that this is going to uh, generate huge amount of uh, invested interest uh, as far as gold is concerned, and certainly a, a part of it will uh, will also uh, will move for silver. Uh, physical demand, particularly retail uh, jewelry demand. Has very nearly collapsed uh, in in both India and China, two of the very large importers and importers and consumers, but uh, primarily because of very high local prices. Uh, uh, but uh, but that has not that has not prevented investors from uh, from betting on on gold and silver, given the the kind of global uncertainty that we are seeing. Uh, so the the question is what 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 is what is uh, where is this market going? That will be answered by if you have uh, if you have answers to these following question: When will an effective vaccine be rolled out? When will economic activity revive? And when will it move towards pre-COVID levels? When will the stock market start to rise again? Will the dollar strengthen? I think the, 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 these these are questions 
uh, answers to which will probably unravel the mysteries of uh, of uh, of uh, gold and uh, silver market primarily silver of course has almost a 50% industrial application therefore uh, silver is a precious metal half precious metal and half uh, uh, in some way industrial metals uh, but uh, because of its industrial nature as economic growth begins to pick up as kunal pointed out in in, in china for example uh, obviously the 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 potential uh, for silver to outperform gold uh, uh, is is uh, appears to be very clear uh, over uh, the whole of uh, 2021 so this is the overall uh, overall scenario that uh, that i'm able to see but uh, to go into specifics of uh, the uh, supply demand fundamentals and for his uh, very erudite thoughts on the on the gold and silver market uh, i'll invite uh, chirag sheth from metal focus uh, uh, to to come and uh, uh, educate us about this market chirag thank you mr chandrashekar uh, thank you to imc and mcx for providing this opportunity i'm going to share a quick presentation and hopefully uh, mr chandrashekar will be able to finish in 15 minutes 15 uh, okay all right 15. Uh, anyway you're going to eat into shivanshu's time therefore i have no complaint <laughs> but it's a joke don't worry i think we'll extend it we yes, we right. will we'll extend it at least till 545 that is okay. what i'm thinking at this point yeah please you know uh, uh, mr chandrashekar started uh, you know and gave uh, some nice points as to why gold prices have gone up i'm not going to go uh, into that but uh, let's just discuss what is happening you know and one question which a lot of people ask us is whether has gold reached its top whether this is in a bubble what is happening yeah. and you pointed out that there is no demand you know the the demand is virtually collapsed now something that i have learned in my uh, limited career tracking precious metals uh, you know gold is like a chameleon okay it will change its color with the time awesome. and awesome. i i always call gold as a commodity as a currency and as an insurance right uh, when uh, when world is uh, growing when the economy is booming it purely behaves as a commodity you look at demand you look at supply and then you determine if your demand is more than supply price it should go up demand is less than supply price it should go down something that we saw between probably 2013 14 till 2018 uh come economic crisis or signs of distress slow down and suddenly gold changes its color to a commodity as an insurance and that is why currently demand and supply is not playing an important role in driving gold prices i think that is something that we need to understand now what exactly is happening in gold is gold is actually going through a phase of consolidation uh, you know i've been saying this this is a 2 3 month consolidation typical of a bull run where usually prices rises by 50 60% and then kind of have sideways movement now there is some strong correlation which gold is having with one is uh you know stock market and i think kunal uh, showed a beautiful chart uh, very listed down you know the amount of money printing which is happening uh, you know most of these money uh, while if you take 2008 uh, a lot of this money went into stock market uh, in come 2020 uh, we are seeing the modern monetary policy coming into play where money is both going into the stock market but also to the main street so both wall street as well as main street is kind of benefiting and that you see from this chart the correlation with gold and stock is a healthy you know 0.5% this is very very good you know usually uh, as as uh, you know analysts of precious metals we've always heard that stock and gold has got negative correlation but the modern monetary theory actually puts every uh, conventional economic logic out of the window uh, now another important question with lot of people talk about and you read these reports saying that you know bond rally the mother of all bull run that we seen in bond is ending and the yields have started to go up so is this end of a gold run actually no if you actually look at the correlation between bond yields and gold at this moment is at the lowest level that we've seen in last many many months and that's why you've not seen a strong reaction on gold compared to what is happening on the bond market so where is gold actually taking its cue from and here is your answer gold is basically taking its cue from the dollar now what is happening currently is gold is actually stuck between the devil and the deep blue sea you know uh, one day uh, there is a talk of stimulus package coming another day there is a talk of uh, you know actually breakdowns of talks uh, another day we think that the virus is and the second wave 
then there are you know news of uh, vaccine so at this moment gold is actually lacking direction and because it is lacking direction it is actually taking direction from the dollar and that's why if you see currently the i would say correlation between gold and dollar is a negative 0.7% which means if dollar moves by down up by 1% gold would actually move down by probably 0.7% if i were to put it crudely in that way now what what is interesting is while dollar is giving you know stiff competition to gold bond yields are not posing any competition so while you know people may talk about the end of mother of bull run in bonds what is happening is that if you look at global investment grade bonds if you look at tips or even if you look at german inflation bonds most of these are proving no competition to gold because these are all negative yielding debt in a sense so the opportunity cost for holding gold is virtually negligible when you try to compare the risk adjusted returns so you know i would i would not compare gold with holding equities right because the risk which gold possesses these are the risk of holding equities is much higher so risk adjusted return of gold at this moment is much higher compared to even bonds thus the opportunity cost of holding gold is is uh, not there now what it does is is actually because of the amount of co strong correlation that gold is having with us dollar and the amount of negative position short position built in the dollar there is always that risk of short covering in the dollar index and thus you know there would be an impact on gold however you know given the fact that uh, you know stimulus will eventually come out why why you know it could be 1 trillion 2 trillion 3 trillion you know uh, we could debate on the value of uh, you know the uh, stimulus package one thing is for sure is that the monetary debasement is like the currency debasement is likely to continue uh, the modern monetary policy is going to dominate the discourse over the next coming years and by the end this whole crisis by the time the whole crisis ends uh, we will have a new definition of fiscal deficit Are no longer in a for example taking case of india you know indian uh, because of the frbm act that we've got we always talk about 3 3.5% fiscal deficit uh, eventually it could very well happen that by the end of this crisis in next 1 2 years the fiscal deficit a normal fiscal deficit could end up being 5% or 6% and that is something that we'll we'll see in the future now another reason why i don't think gold is still in a bubble and and this is one chart which actually i i love because it is in gold's favor in a sense Uh, if you actually look at 2010 2011 when gold prices literally hit off the roof uh, s&p market capitalization visa we gold was 1.8% uh, currently this is less than a percent so which means that s&p the equity market has actually expanded much widely compared to the gold holdings or gold trading volumes in that sense and we still haven't reached that limit so i would say you know gold is nowhere in the bubble form probably it has got one of the best fundamentals that we've seen uh, in my 16 year career i have never seen such great fundamentals for uh, gold why does it mean that gold will reach 5000 dollars 6000 dollars probably we don't know at this moment but what i can surely say is that the bull run is still uh, not over now let's look at some of the numbers uh, which are there uh if you if you if you basically uh, look at the comex positions uh, you have a scenario where uh, you know there has been a technical selling by funds uh, by hedge funds by money managers over the last uh, couple of weeks and that's why i often don't like looking at this figure because uh, the comex uh, positions is largely uh, not so much sticky it's more tactical in nature it's more trading in nature what is worth looking at is the etp holding over the last one year we've seen consistent flows of gold in the ebs today etps actually hold the largest amount of gold in a sense uh, nearly 3100 tons of gold holdings is in etps and this somewhere you know brings out the strength of institutional investors now a lot of people would say that etps is actually retail but uh, you know some of our clients based out the us and europe have seen a strong buying from their institutional clients uh, into etf and somewhere the stickiness of etf is the strength of the institutional uh, demand in a sense if you look at uh, above ground underground supply which is basing mining uh, we expect the 5% drop in 2020 uh, 
Uh, so you're looking at a scenario where, uh, you know, about 175 tons of drop in production from the mines are largely coming in from uh, Central and South America and Africa uh, because of the shutdown, especially likes of Peru, uh, Brazil, which was shut uh, for a couple of months. And this is actually also uh, you know, kind of spilled out to some of the other commodities as well. Uh, so we expect about 175 tons of uh, drop in production. Uh, Recycling is, is, is looking up extremely strong. So while overall supply, we expect about 4,700 tons this year, uh, uh, the drop in mine supply would be mitigated by the strong recycling growth. Uh, we've seen uh, strong recycling growth in uh, Southeast Asia, uh, even in India for that matter, we've seen strong recycling and in the Western world. So the scrap supply is, is very, very robust. And this is something which always happens whenever gold prices goes up, you see a jump in scrap supply. And 2020 is actually coupled with not just higher gold prices, but economic distress uh, you know, as well. If you look at global demand, uh, this is probably one of the sharpest drop in demand uh, that we've seen in nearly decades, you know, 25% drop in demand uh, you know, from 3,900 tons in 2019, uh, we expect demand to drop uh, to about 3,000 tons. Uh, now, if you see from this chart, you are looking at a 540 tons drop in uh, jewelry demand, so virtually 20% drop in jewelry demand. Uh, India, China, most of the Southeast Asian economies, Middle East are all uh, are all uh, uh, you know kind of uh, clocking in double digit drop in demand. Another important sector which was a big contributor to gold demand uh, was uh, central banks. However, this year we feel that the central bank uh, demand is likely to drop by about 300 tons. Last year, central bank did about 600 odd tons. This is central bank is likely to do just 300 tons. Now, what is something that we need to understand is that most of the central banks are now focusing on uh, COVID and focusing on stimulus uh, and how to revive the economy. So most of them need the money. Most of them need the ammunition. And that's why we believe that probably this year central banks would be a bit cautious. However, we expect central banks to return to the market probably late 2021 or early uh, 2022. So, you know, when you look at all these things, you know, you look at a scenario where uh, the economic crisis is there. You look at a scenario where, uh, you know, there is a printing of monetary, a printing of currency, low interest rate. Now, you know, Mr. Chandrasekhar pointed out one thing, you know, vaccine. Now, this is something that we always tell to our clients. Uh, vaccine or no vaccine, uh, the global economy will take a lot of time to recover. Uh, even if we have a vaccine, there are a lot of questions with regards to the efficacy of vaccine. Uh, whether vaccine will have more than 50% efficacy, 70% efficacy, that is something that we don't know. Uh, plus, we are a seven and a half billion population. You know, India has got 1.3 billion population. It is going to take take a mammoth effort, warlike effort, uh, to give vaccine to each and every individual in this entire world. So, obviously, what is going to happen is that it could take at least two to three years for the vaccine to reach everybody. Our sense is that interest rates will remain low for another year, year and a half. Uh, and if you if you look at historically with gold, uh, till gold actually tends to top out probably nine to twelve months before the interest rate scenario keeps on changing. Now, if you look at commentary from various central banks, uh, everybody's talking about you know probably keeping low interest rates up till 2022 probably. So in a sense, there is still a lot of uh, I would say uh, you know legs for gold to go higher. Uh, once once we've got clarity on stimulus, once we've got clarity on the U.S. election, uh, we will see a next wave of, uh, you know, increase in gold prices. Uh, quickly moving on to silver, uh, one thing which is very, very important, and I think, uh, uh, you know, I would like to point out is uh, silver, in a sense, uh, behaves either as a precious metals or as a base metal. So now it is very, very important to understand when you are tracking silver or when you are investing in silver, what is silver behaving as? Is it behaving as a base metal? Is it behaving as a precious metal? Because if it is behaving as a base metal, you would want to look at how copper is behaving or how zinc or lead for that matter is behaving. If it is behaving as a precious metal, then you would look at gold. So we've kind of created a framework for silver. Uh, if you look at currently, uh, the delta in gold prices is positive for silver. Uh, even the delta for global manufacturing is positive for silver because manufacturing is slowly improving. Uh, the only thing which is negative for silver at this moment is the exchange inventory. We are sitting on decent amount of inventory. Uh, what is also interesting is silver usually 
if you look at silver has been in over supply for many a years now so demand and supply dynamics play a little role in in silver in that sense it's more of how sentiment is and i always said silver is actually gold on steroids uh, if gold would go up by 10 20% silver would actually go up by 40 50% and we've seen that what happened between april may and now if you look at silver there are some positives which are coming out on the fundamental side as well uh the capex cycle the mining capex cycle is extremely thin at this moment and this is true for both gold and silver if you actually look at uh, uh the mining cycle or the investment over the last 8 8 uh, 9 years uh, those have been extremely low so obviously because the capex cycle is slow uh, it is likely to help uh, you know silver uh, in terms of uh, price uh, going forward Uh, another interesting thing is the big the big thing is the photovoltaic uh, installation the pvs uh, and and obviously uh, we expect uh, you know sharp jump in uh, you know pv installation uh, over the next uh, couple of years time by 2024 uh, we should have about 140 uh, gigawatts of pv installation this helps uh, you know every uh, every uh, in a sense uh, pv cell module requires you know silver phase and and as and as more and more countries uh, move towards renewable energy more and more countries move uh, comes under the international solar alliance uh, we will see uh, you know kind of uh, this uh, demand picking up uh, silver akin to gold has also seen very very strong uh, you know institutional demand uh, if you actually speak with mints like the uh, you know we sell the american eagle or the canadian royal mint or even degusa they would tell you that you know about 3 or 4 months ago most of them ran out of silver you know they could just not fulfill the demand so very very strong institutional demand very very strong retail demand uh, lastly i would like to say that you know uh, while everybody likes ratio and i say ratio is like husband and wife when everything is good ratios work perfectly well but you know when things become a bit dicey you know that relationship also breaks so while people like to look at the ratios i am not a big fan of actually ratio trading i would say that silver is underperformed gold so obviously there is a long long i would say upside for silver given the fundamentals given what is happening on the gold side so i would like to sum up uh, with simple line is there is still lot of strength left in this bull run uh, you know something that jp morgan said you know many many years ago gold is money everything else is credit so you know gold is one of the best i would say should be part of your portfolio back to you mr chandrashekar all right thank you very much uh, chirag for this very wonderful uh, presentation uh, uh, absolutely a great snapshot of uh, of the gold and silver market yes uh, we can't agree with you more uh, one one concern uh, which which i i have always uh, had in mind is that uh, if 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 gdp the global gdp does not grow uh, rapidly even 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 if vaccine were to be found uh, it is logical to expect that it will grow but uh, for for some reason if it stays quite muted which means the production of goods and services will be uh, will see limited growth which means supplies of the goods and services will be will 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 will, will slow or the growth of that will slow but on the other hand we'll have too much of liquidity uh, given this ultra accommodative policy this is sure to lead to inflation low supply growth very high uh, monetary uh, uh, money money supply growth that can potentially lead to inflation i believe uh, this this easy money policy will certainly continue till the end of 2021 particularly in the united states there's no doubt at all but somewhere inflation will begin to catch up and when inflation begins to catch up and reaches a certain uh, level where the uh, where the uh, fed begins to feel uncomfortable they will not hesitate to roll back uh, these policies when will that happen last quarter of 2021 first quarter of 2022 or second half of 2022 we don't know but but it can potentially happen Uh, so it's very very interesting uh, but next three quarters i think uh, uh, gold and silver are on fairly safe grounds given the kind of money supplies uh, that are available and the strength of the financial investors and the holding power really speaking 
Great, uh, wonderful. Thank you very much. I'm not going to invite uh, Shivanshu for uh, uh, to to talk about uh, gold and silver contracts on MCX. Uh, possibly, I'm sure Shivanshu will also talk about uh, 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 the the uh, the index which they have launched recently. Shivanshu, the floor is yours. Yes. Uh, firstly, I thank Mr. Chandrasekhar. I thank Mr. Khorakiwala and uh, the August Chambers of the IMC. Uh, with whom we've uh, been associated for a long time to spread awareness, uh, knowledge and awareness about the commodity segment amongst retail uh, participants as well as industry. And in one such uh, uh, effort today, I, I shall uh, take you through, you know, uh, the exchange, uh, you know, uh, platform, the products, the theme, method and manner behind which uh, we are attempting to develop this uh, you know, product segment further. Of course, there's been a history of uh, association of MCX with the bullion segment as Mr. Chandrasekhar was uh, correctly pointing out some time back. So in keeping with that, it is incumbent upon the exchange to further innovate at every uh, stage and to become even more relevant with what the theme and manner of the times are. So having said that, I'll just uh, quickly move on to the presentation. There. So like, uh, just to contextualize uh, the precious metals and, and specifically uh, precious metals while overall commodities uh, is an important point that we investors have often seen not only between 2008 to 2012, but even as recently as from March to, to the current month is that there is a, a historic negative correlation between commodities and other asset classes. And on your screen, you can see that mapped out. Uh, one is commodities versus uh, various uh, listed equities of various regions of, of the world on the left-hand side, graphically, and other asset classes like gilts, real estate, etc. And on the right side uh, is a table which maps a commodities index with a proven bond uh, index, global bond index, US equities, as well as the US inflation, or I should use the word consumer price index. If you see very clearly that there is a negative correlation that commodities have with all these three segments, and why we emphasize this before uh, beginning uh, the presentation is that commodities are essentially known as portfolio diversifiers they bring stability to the portfolios by reducing what is called the volatility or the beta and also increasing the overall return potential. And there has been empirical proof that a portfolio with about 20% presence of commodities or managed futures as they call them, the returns have been seen to be maximum and the risk has been seen to be minimum. Now, this is to contextualize what commodities as an asset class, especially precious metals, brings to the table for retail investors. Now we will get into certain nuances of how the story has been in terms of MCX and how the MCX prices and products have uh, been recognized today as uh, uh, you know, our contribution towards domestic benchmarks as such. If you see, uh, the most important uh, thing here is that the constitution of the price. So MCX prices, they inbuilt uh, the gold, international gold prices or silver prices. The exchange rate in terms of the currency exchange rate, the USD versus INR, as well as the import duty tariff. As you're aware that the custom duty tariff changes twice of a month on a fortnightly basis. So also does the currency uh, rate used to evaluate or, or to value those imports and, and gold uh, and silver largely being imported into the country. The constitution of the price thereby becomes highly correlated with 
both the spot prices of the country as well as the international prices of bullion. And that is why we find that today we have a deep and intense participation of the hedgers from across the value chain, right from the import onto the bullion trade, onto the jewelers, branded, listed, small, medium, large, and even exporters of jewelry. They all participate and partake of this hedging activity on MCX. Therefore, the prices are often used to quote MCX plus minus in terms of the products uh, across the value chain in the country. The correlation when uh, studied in terms of percentages, you can see well over 98, 99% range. And the trading hours in India are such that we get to see most of the international markets starting with Tocom, China, the European uh, you know, countries, the, LBM, uh, the LBMA fixes, and then of course the US electronic markets of COMEX and then MCX closes shop. So you're able to see the entire happenings in your working trading hours. This is the beauty of India. Just to contextualize the numbers before I get into the products, uh, well, it has been a, a stellar uh, a year, year uh, uh, thus far, as well as the previous year itself, if you see on the chart, FY1920 was 91% higher than uh, 1819 in terms of the turnover. And uh, that was 11,257 crores. We are at 19,000 crores uh, on a YTD basis in FY21. So tremendous liquidity for participants is what I'm trying to say. And we continue to see that uh, in September 2020 and going forward. And as you can see, the average open interest and the volumes are provided below. So that goes to show the comfort level of the order books in terms of the depth, uh, as well as uh, in terms of the liquidity and participation. Coming to the products that we uh, you know, have for the market segments in various denominations, uh, starting with the benchmark contract, which is the kilo contract, which basically they're all deliverable contracts that we have compulsory delivery. So here the delivery is of a one kilo bar of gold. It's a bi-monthly contract. Then we have a gold mini 100 gram contract, which is a monthly contract. Here the delivery unit itself is a 100 gram bar, small bar of gold. And then we have the coin product, which is the gold eight grams guinea. And we are... Uh, the only exchange globally, and this has been uh, a record probably uh, set in 2019, November, when we launched the world's first and only deliverable one gram contract called the gold petal. And uh, the idea behind this is that it's important for, for uh, us to develop organized ways in which to invest in for retail investors when they look at gold as an asset class. So this has seen a good response. I'll, I'll go into that number a little later. Now look at the volatility. If you see that small table between the chart on the top and the chart below. So the volatility has also been going up uh, you know, in, F in 2020 along with the prices, which have gone from even uh, if you talk about the lockdown from 39,000 to all the way to 56,000 and now around just shy of 51,000. So this volatility is, is uh, to be paraphrased here because not only the retail, but also the physical industry who participates on the exchanges needs to mitigate its price risk. Uh, because like they say, not hedging is basically speculation. You cannot put your fabrication margin, which may be minuscule, uh, in front of uh, a, a, a hugely volatile and choppy asset class the base price that is. So therefore hedging is a must. And uh, as you can see, there is a healthy open interest in the system, which provides comfort for large hedgers as well as small hedgers who are all uh, present uh, in our contracts. If you look at silver, again, we have a 30 kg benchmark contract where the delivery is of a 30 kg bar. And then there are two smaller contracts for hedgers and both of those are also deliverable. One is the silver five kg and one is the silver micro, which is one kg contract. Both of them have the same delivery unit, which is the one kilo bar of silver. 
and this uh, change has also been brought about as per the regulatory norms in March and June respectively in silver micro and mini and we have already seen 22 metric tons of silver delivered by, by this new uh, newly deliverable one, uh, one kilogram contract uh, in, in, in terms of uh, a pure retail offering. So there again, uh, it has been a, a good response to this product. As you can see, the whopping number of 43% volatility in the financial year 2020, I mean, in the calendar year 2020. So silver, which has moved again from that 34, 35,000 in March, all the way to over 70,000 and now rests at around 62,000. It has been you know, massively volatile. And we have participation of silver uh, industry. Uh, like Mr. Chandrasekhar said, it is an industrial uh, commodity uh, before being also a precious metal. So we have the participation of, uh, you know, that industry as well. Coming to the one gram contract, like I mentioned, this can be an ideal product for uh, initially for retail investors who want to utilize the exchange wherein you get a high quality, assured quality product. We get a tamper proof uh, packaging. Uh, you get a transparent price and where the making charges are kept clear and uh, uh, over and above the basic price, which you lock in. And that is 100 rupees making charge, which the seller pays and goes to the buyer. And all of this, all of these products uh, are electronically enabled. The holding can be in DMAT form. Accumulation can be in DMAT form. And you can take out the physical gold or silver as and when you, you like from the vaults. The silver micro I already talked about. Again, one kg contract electronically holdable. And the, the making charges in that case are 400 rupees over and above the price at which the trade gets consummated. Uh, now coming to what volatility means uh, for the physical industry. Uh, and this is another important role as a risk management platform, which an exchange must play. So when we say 19% volatility witnessed in 2020, it means that suppose there is a, a gold based company with a turnover of 1000 crores, just as an example, 190 crores of that amount would be at risk unless that company mitigates that risk by using exchange traded futures and options contracts, or either of them, or combinations of them. So also, if you see the Indian context, the Indian gold uh, import as such, let's say, back of the envelope number of two lakh crores, 38 thousand crores out of that would be uh, at risk without a proper uh, hedge in place via derivatives. So what is this hedging that we talk about? Essentially, there are only two types of scenarios. One is that you have a price fixed, but you don't have the metal. The other is that you have a metal, but you don't have the order for it. So in both these types of mismatches, essentially what you do is you take an opposing position in derivatives, in futures, we will come to options a little later, than you would in the physical market. What are the advantages of this hedging activity? It's efficient use of capital. You only book the margin and you lock in the price. You, you are able to buy the insurance policy as such by paying the basic margin. And thereby you are able to protect the profit the fabrication markup and be able to meet the obligations which are committed to your clients. Your inventory can get hedged and uh, depending on the policy which your company may have, uh, you may like to book that inventory forward or take a valuation for it, etc. And the participation is diverse. So the risk basically gets transferred from hedgers to speculators and in between other jobbers and the arbitrages. This is a typical liquid uh, model of an exchange. Just to give you an example very quickly, suppose a, a gold ornament, uh, suppose a walk-in customer wants to lock in the price with the jeweler. He says that, yes, uh, you give me the, the advance and I accept the order at 51,000. So the gold against this, by locking in the price at the exchange, the jeweler gets the comfort of buying this gold in phases you know, intermittently 
and then building the jewelry from it, thereby creating a working capital efficiency. So in both the scenarios, one in which the price rises, two in which the price falls, in both the cases, the effect mitigates each other, that is the effect on the future side or the future's leg and the effect on the spot leg are equal and opposite to each other. And therefore the price which gets locked in is 51,000. For example, at the time of the order, the price was 50,800. The jeweler books this price by buying futures as and when he purchases the jewelry. If the price has gone to 50,400, he sells it, buys the physical stock, 400 rupees are lost this side, 400 rupees are gained that side and vice versa. So this is an example of hedging by pure and uh, vanilla futures. In this case, there is no profit and no loss. In the case of options, there is the uh, probability of being profitable on one side while locking in the adverse side, which I'll come to. So that is what is different between options and futures. I'll be just coming to that. Before which I just want to throw light. When we say compulsory delivery and when we say benchmark price, you can see that the proof of the pudding, basically uh, there has been more than 118 tons of gold delivered since inception and 3,500 odd tons of silver delivered since inception of the platform. The highest in any single contract was last year when the duty was imposed, uh, uh, was increased in the month of October, 5.15 uh, tons of gold. Very recently, last month, we saw the highest ever delivery of silver in 12 year high, I mean to say, in a single contract, 140 metric tons. And that was the time when silver markets, physical and spot were going through highly disparate and uncertain times. So we saw the meeting of the two at the exchange uh, in terms of delivery, which again is a very uh, notable and a healthy development. And as you can see the new contracts, 20,000 odd coins, when I mentioned the gold petal, have already changed hands over the past year. And in terms of silver, one uh, a mini and micro, the one kg has seen 22 tons. So these two products can be looked at by organized retail investors at the exchange. This is the 140 tons. Now coming to the option products that we have, we have option in futures in the kilo gold, which has been in place for uh, just over three years, 17th of October, 2017 on Dhanteras is when we launched it. And the 30 kg in, in the next year, May 2018. So these two are getting more and more established in terms of liquidity and they have hit various highs recently. We have also come up with an option in goods because this product got notified recently and as a different product, which wherein the options directly result in delivery. We have launched this on the 100 gram bar and already in the first, uh, in the second or the uh, delivery cycle, it saw 39 lots devolve, uh, you know, or, or uh, uh, get settled by way of delivery. So that is again a healthy sign. You can see active open interest prevails or remains in these products. The mature product of gold 1kg options saw an all time high open interest of 8.75 tons of gold, 8,750 kgs of gold uh, in the month of March, that is when the lockdown started, and uncertainty peaked. And those were the times when COMEX and uh, the LBMA saw uh, an unprecedented uh, level of disparity or basis spread, or, or what is called the EFP, uh, you know, it was never seen before. So those were the times and at all such times, the exchange plays a role of uh, making the, the two meet and safeguarding the industry by way of, uh, you know, the efficacy of the price and the delivery mechanism. Now options very quickly as hedging instruments, I mentioned insurance, I mentioned participation on the favorable side, yes. The maximum loss is to the extent of the premium paid 
and when you use futures and options together you get leverage as well as safety a gazillion strategies can be formulated around this better cash flow management one time payment of premium that is and lower transaction cost lower blocking of capital as such these are the advantages what do people do with these i i will only quickly talk about the hedging strategies uh, one or two of them okay does it is, I'll, i'll propose what the producer and the the bullion dealer uh, hedging what i'm talking about is the costless collar wherein mining companies are able to protect the the projected mine output by basically selling a call higher above the money and buying that uh, sorry using that money to buy the put options by using that money to use as premium to buy the put options thereby protecting both the sides and creating a sort of a ceiling and floor effect this is a pure hedging strategy very interestingly in the mcx context over the past 2 to 1 and a half years many jewelers have used a flexible pricing scheme in this very current season that we are in that is diwali they have used mcx put options to be able to offer the lowest price between a number of days or a, or a time frame of 15 days or so uh, by uh, offering that price of walk in to the walk in customer and telling him that it's either this price or the lowest uh, lowest uh, between today and the diwali so this is an interesting scheme possible made possible by put options and we continue to see this happening so these are some of the things in which options come in of use inventory hedging monetizing the idle stock by way of premium writing calls above the money when the implied volatility is higher the implied volatility has a role to play on the premiums it has an impact so there can be times when it makes more sense to sell call a uh, sell options to hedge and there can be times when premiums are lesser it makes more sense for buying options to hedge so this is uh, just a sketch and volatility is nothing but the standard deviation of daily returns expressed in annualized terms and uh, so this is what i was talking about the strategy to buy puts and offer the flexible price to your walk in customers it's been uh, already proven as a successful strategy some of the leading jewelers who are listed also they have employed this to their to their success very quickly to give you an example of how an options hedge works and I'm, i'm only going to talk about a put so suppose your uh, bullion dealer has a risk of inventory from falling prices so that dealer will buy a put at 51000 let's say he pays 1% on premium 500 and 10 rupees if the prices go up <clears throat> the loss is limited to this premium and nothing else if the prices go down this this actual loss is compensated by appreciation in the put premium therefore uh, there may be uh, a protection which is actually availed as an insurance premium payout and a protection at 51000 that's it to give you a numerical uh, you know table on that very clear at 51000 if you see in the middle 510 rupees you you pay and you buy the put now your loss remains limited at 510 if the prices start rising however if the prices fall then you can see that actually at one particular uh, price which is uh, where you even out or break even your put premium pay up paid you will actually start making money so this is how a typical payout chart way of chart of the options is this is the gold mini options which are option in goods which we launched recently i have already mentioned uh, this is a di different product and it has also uh, picked up now about uh, 25 to 30 crores is happening every day and we are seeing a good number of members coming in some of the advantages of this product are mentioned it goes directly into delivery the most important uh, advantage here is that you know since the exchange has liquid futures as well as liquid options products portfolio margining benefit you know it's by having all the types of products available futures of four types and options of two types in gold you are able to 
in a very layman's uh, language, your margin is much lesser when you take hedge positions across these four, four, six products or any two of them. The idea is that the margin paid becomes <clears throat> netted at a portfolio level. And we have designed our products such that even the delivery between options on goods and futures can be netted off on the last day. We've designed the product like that. So your obligations get netted off and you're able to hedge and, and also to make profit. The Bulldex, another new product which we launched, what Mr. Chandrasekhar was pointing, uh, you know, this is actually turned out to be a good, a good success. The retail investors here get the added advantage of it being cash settled, it being monthly, it being of lower lot size or lot value as compared to the parent gold and silver contracts. Thereby the margin is lesser. And <clears throat> so basically it is an index of precious metals in the ratio currently of 70.5 and 29.5 gold is to silver. This will be rebalanced or reweighted in the coming year, depending on the liquidity and the turnover, as well as the physical market dynamics of these two commodities. But we are doing about 200, 250 crores per day in this recent period since launch, or in fact, since day one of launch, it's been doing well. And uh, we feel it has potential to actually become an index of choice when it comes to investing. It, it, it's a portfolio aimed product. It brings precious metal exposure to the portfolio, just like you have equity indices, which are basically a, a sort of, a, a, you know, a combination of various stocks. This is a combination of gold and silver. That's it. At the last slide, I'll just quickly share with you some of the milestones which this year we have achieved 50,000 crores hit a seven and a half year high in the month of July and the individual highs you can see including the gold options March 16th all time high in terms of uh, your turnover and one and a half year high in terms of volume I mean turnover uh, sorry open interest and volume and so also certain other highs so at the end of it I thank you all once again for your patience and I shall leave our email ID in the, uh, in the comments column for all of you to interact with us and learn more. Thank you. Thank you, Shivanshu. Uh, first, heartiest congratulations on some absolutely stellar performance. The numbers are very clear. Number two, thank you very much for a uh, uh, very insightful presentation as uh, you always do. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, so kind of you, Chandrasekhar Ji. You're right. the real guru of commodities. Hey, thank you. Thank you, Beta. Uh, now, it's about two hours, and I was looking at the chat box. Uh, if people have questions, kindly post, but I haven't seen uh, many questions uh, coming in. Uh, some, of the, some of our uh, participants want the presentation copy, some of, uh, but uh, we will certainly upload the entire event on YouTube maybe in a couple of days. Uh, we'll do that. Uh, uh, we have, but we are, we have completely run out of time. That's uh, for me. Uh, 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 this is such an interesting topic. We should have had more time, uh, but I thought we'll compress it in about 90 minutes, but it's already 120 minutes. Uh, but just before I wind up, I want to give each speaker starting with Kunal. Kunal, are you there? Yes, he's there. Okay, exactly. Uh, one to one and a half minutes, each one of the speaker. Do you have any closing remarks to make? Anything you want to sum up your thoughts, but very quickly. One minute, exactly one minute each. Pardon, pardon me, I'm, uh, I'm doing a thankless job of, uh, of pushing all my panelists, but I have no choice. Yeah. Kunal, are you there? I he's think on, he's uh, on mute. He's on mute, but uh, he's, yeah. I don't think he's... he's, he's uh, uh, he's there in front of his uh, screen. Uh, let me go to uh, uh, let me go to uh, Rashmi. Rashmi, do you have anything to add in a minute? Rashmi, unmute yourself. Right. So I'm sorry. Uh, you know, till I could get myself unmuted. 
so you know just quickly to to sum up in terms of uh, what's really happening at the exchange from a base metals perspective mm -hmm. i just want to you know uh, summarize uh, what i said earlier uh, that the exchange is preparing itself to move to as far as base metals is concerned i could call it base metals 2.0 because we've now moved from becoming going from a cash settled contract dependent on international prices yeah. to being an india delivered contract so you know the prices will have more indian fundamentals impacting it it will be a more india price benchmark uh, you know ideally people should start you know from the industry while a lot of people have already started participating i think we would now like that you know the indian industry should use these prices to actually you know work in the industry and have lesser and lesser dependence uh, you know on the international prices to conduct their daily businesses as far as uh, you know going towards uh, adding more grades and more um, you know metal uh, grades in the entire repertoire that we have currently in base metals the endeavor is to bring more and more uh, indian producers or indian grades uh, right. you know to be deliverable on mcx and ultimately the goal is to see that we can create an mcx approved brand list so that we are not dependent on you know what the what international markets really uh, dictate i know we still have a long way to go you know to become complete price uh, makers as mm. far as base metals is concerned but having said that i i think that you know we have we have taken baby steps towards doing that and finally that's what the endeavor is as far as the base metal segment at mcx is concerned thank you rashmi i'm absolutely bullish on india's uh, base metals and industrial metals consumption uh, uh, demand uh, over the next decade very very bullish and and that that's going to happen whether we want it or not we like it or not our demand is is is, is going to expand rapidly uh, we may not be china uh, they are at a very different scale but uh, the direction is very clear i think we are, we are moving in that direction therefore all that you are doing today will bear fruit uh, Over a period of time. Thank you very much, Chirag. Are you there? Yes, Mr. Jain. Any, any passing comment, Chirag? In a minute. Uh, so I'll, I'll just say this thing that uh, you know, the precious metals investors should not worry about what happened on the gold price or silver price on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, the fundamentals are extremely strong at this moment. Uh, you know, market is likely to trade higher over the next year or so. And uh, uh, given the way, uh, given the uh, things that we are in, one should have at least. 10 to 15 percent of uh, you know exposure to precious metals. All right, thank, thank you. Uh, I am not sure if Kunal is back. Uh, I, I thought uh, I stopped him earlier. I'm, I'm back, sir. Ah, Kunal, you, sir. I'm back, sir. One minute. Uh, you yeah. have one minute. If you have any passing comments, uh, uh, thought to wind up uh, or whatever you were talking. Yeah, very yeah. quickly. So, so I uh, I'm of the same view of what uh, Chira just said. no need to worry there will be small corrections but with so much liquidity around even base metal complex doesn't look very bearish and uh, any correction would be a buying opportunity the overall outlook looks strong and uh, like uh, uh, you said everyone so if the inflation is coming commodity is the best place to be in awesome awesome great thank you very much uh, i think with this uh, with great reluctance i need to i need to conclude this event hopefully when we do this commodity market fundamental forum i remember we did a physical event last year at the chamber which ran for 4 hours because we covered uh, uh, energy base metals and uh, <laughs> precious metals and agriculture i think that's the kind of time we need uh, we will probably hopefully 2021 will provide us opportunity to uh, meet physically and uh, and exchange notes uh, and thought i want to thank all my co panelists for uh, Uh, for sharing their thoughts has been very very enriching uh, i was very pleased to see more than 160 people uh, who had logged on uh, and uh, of course the, the numbers have slightly fallen now but uh, i think it, uh, i'm sure it's been quite enriching uh, for all the participants uh, we will conclude this uh, event all this uh, the proceedings will be on youtube hopefully by thursday or friday uh, wait for it Uh, and whoever wants a presentation can obviously write uh, either to uh, write to the chamber write to anita naik and i'm sure we'll be able to we'll be able to share uh, the presentation with this i want to conclude this event i also want to thank all the participants i want to thank 
uh, MCX on behalf of the Indian Merchant Chamber. I want to thank uh, MCX and good luck. God bless you all. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, everyone. Thanks, Anita. It's always Thanks, a pleasure Anita. to interact with you. Same here. Thanks, team IMC. Thanks, all the co panelists. Thanks, Chirag Funal. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Chandrasekhar.